Like gonads. Okay. <laughs> This is Brecken and Jonathan, and welcome to another week of Gem Junkies. Last week, I left off the uh, the episode with uh, "The World Is Our Oyster," which was a mistake on my end because then everyone requested pearls. <laughs> so I guess pearls it is. Pearls it is today. We're gonna talk, and we're gonna have to split pearls up into two parts because there is a lot. A lot to talk about with pearls. A lot of different kinds, a lot yeah. of different ways to make them, mm-hmm. to treat them, Yep. to play with them. Yep. So we're going to kind of go at, at this at kind of a two-part thing, but we I'm, I've snuck in on a Thursday to record because the twins started preschool this week. Yeah. So it was the first day was they were looking good. They were looking fly. They had their unicorn backpacks. They were happy. And they didn't want to leave. No. There were no tears. No, you had to drag them out at the <laughs> end. No tears on either end. They no. I got by Felicia when they got to the door. And I was like, see ya, I'm going to TJ Maxx. <laughs> Mommy time. Yep. Alright. Okay. Pearls. So we've got we've got a time crunch because we've got to go pick up those twenties. Pick them up. Alright. Pearls were first mentioned in history. Do you know when? I don't when. In 2200 BC by a Chinese historian. That's when pearls were first mentioned in history. And they have been symbols of wealth and status for thousands of years. Yeah. They're associated with the moon because they're spherical orbs like the moon in the sky. And the sea because they come from the sea. But in ancient China, it was believed that they protected you against fire-breathing dragons. Ooh. And in ancient Europe, they signified modesty, chastity, and purity. Probably because of the color white, I would guess. But um, ancient, ancient sources of pearls... So where these ancient people get pearls was the Persian Gulf, waters off of the coast of Ceylon. That's Ceylon. They've got everything. Everything. Uh, Chinese rivers and lakes and rivers in Europe. And did you know that Christopher Columbus discovered pearls when he came to the New World? I did not. Mm -hmm. He did. In fact, there is um, a Native American burial in Ohio where they found pearls, and it was dated 2,000 years ago. Freshwater? I would guess from the rivers of America. The rivers of America. Yeah, Christopher Columbus, on his third and fourth voyages, encountered native people adorned in pearls, which, of course, led the Europeans to overfish and deplete the pearl source uh, off the coast of Venezuela and Panama. It created extensive European interest in the New World. That and emeralds. I have a super cool story. You know this story. It's about Cleopatra and her pearls. Yeah. And how she seduced Mark Anthony with her pearls. Big pearls. Big pearls. So we all know that Cleopatra and Caesar had a thing. They had a kid. Caesar gets stabbed, he dies. What's Cleopatra going to do? She has to somehow protect Egypt from being conquered by the Romans. Seduce the next guy in line. Seduce the next man in line. So Mark Anthony comes by to pay a visit. She throws a big feast, huge feast. She's like, I'm going to win him over by drinking my pearl earring. She takes off her pearl, dumps it in vinegar, Let's Supposedly. It, suppo- this is a story. Let's it dissolve, then drinks it. And from that instant, Mark Anthony was like, this girl's got it. I'm in love. For, and the rest is history. Yeah. But there's a lot of historians and gemologists that don't think the story is credible. 
Right. Because it would take much longer than a dinner feast to melt a pearl in vinegar. True. So I went and I was like, how could this be possible? Now, there is some revived interest in the story, and there are some theories and some people that think this could be true. She could have crushed the pearl first. Which would have dissolved quicker. Which would have dissolved it quicker. So, and I'm thinking, how could she possibly drink a glass of vinegar? Yeah. I mean, seriously. But what happens when you put a pearl into vinegar is there's an acid and a base reaction. So you have your vinegar, which is the acid, and that's neutralized by the pearl, which is actually a calcium carbonate similar to an antacid. So she could have drank it, and it might not have tasted too bad. So the theory is she either crushed the pearl, let it dissolve, and then drank it, or she swallowed it whole and recovered it for later use. Much more economical. <laughs> is that another one of the theories? Yeah, that she, she just did. dumped it in there and swallowed it, and there you go. Maybe let it dissolve a little bit, but recovered it and put it back in her earring. Gross. Totally gross, okay. but... So pearls were I th- expensive. Yeah, and so I think you mentioned a little bit there about what is a pearl. Right? Yes. Calcium. Calcium carbonate. carbonate. And natural pearls are created when an irritant, right. which is foreign matter. We often think of like a little grain of sand. Which is not true. Which is not true. It's pretty much never a grain <laughs> of sand. It's either like a parasite or like... Bunch of other things, but very rarely ever sand. Yeah, so whatever irritant or foreign matter gets trapped in the fleshy mantle of a pearl bearing mollusk, it will then become coated with nacre. And it's the same material that makes up the mother of pearl that lines the, the inside of the shell. Inside of the shell. And that's how you can tell what kind of pearl a mollusk will do what color it will provide by the lip of the Mm -hmm. mollusk. And so the nacre is composed of layers of what is called aragonite. Aragonite. That's what I'm going with. Aragonite, which is crystallized form of calcium carbonate, and conchoilin, which is an organic protein that binds the crystals together, similar to a glue. Right. And so what happens with these layers is that light will come in and it will reflect the light to give the pearl its luster, but it also refracts or disperses the light to produce the iridescence, which we call orient in pearls. Yeah, so you have a combination of reflection, refraction, and diffraction of the light from the translucent layers. And then the thinner and more numerous the layers of the pearl, the finer the luster. Mm -hmm. And then the iridescence the pearls display is caused by the overlapping successive layers, which breaks up the light on the surface. Yeah, it's crazy how the light passes through it, but also reflects from it. I mean, it's beautiful. If you've ever seen a gorgeous pearl, it looks like you could get lost in it because it looks like you could just fall into the pearl. Like it's a pillowy, soft, beautiful moon. Right. (laughs) Wow. Well, I went, I went there. Okay. Uh, so pearls were, were treasured in ancient times. Caesar invaded Britain for the pearls. Henry VIII and Queen Elizabeth, his daughter, were constantly dripping in pearls. In fact, in 1917, Pierre Cartier traded a double strand of natural pearls for a mansion on Fifth Avenue. That's how prized and valued they were. Now, overfishing led to depletion, of course, of of the natural pearl market. But we also had an introduction of cultured pearls that happened in modern times around 1890s, 1900s. And so what, what happened? The Chinese have been making cultured blister pearls since the 13th century. That art was kind of lost and then rediscovered again in the ni- early late 1900s. No. Okay. No, late 1800s. Late 1800s. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So a cultured blister pearl is where a pearl is formed by gluing a nucleus under the mantle tissue inside the mollusk shell. So basically it's a pearl. It looks like a half pearl. 
that is formed on the actual mollusk's shell, not inside the mollusk to give you a complete sphere, but on the shell to give you more of like a dome. Yeah, on a blister pearl. A, br- a blister pearl. Right. And so um, Mikimoto, we all know Mikimoto pearls. They're the famous pearls. He's the one that is really famous for starting this revolution of cultured pearls. He did the blistered pearls in 1890, and then by 1920, he was marketing cultured whole pearls internationally. During World War II, though, had to shut down. Japan was at war with the U.S. Nothing was happening. In the 1940s, though, he revived his cultured pearl business, and actually a lot of U.S. soldiers purchased cultured pearls in Japan and brought them home for their sweethearts which popularized pearls in the U.S. Hmm. There you go. War was good for Mikimoto. For Mikimoto and, and popularizing pearls. Yeah. From there, he he really worked with what is called Akoya pearls. That's what um, Japan is known for, their cultured Akoya pearls. You saw South Sea pearls from Australia come in the 1950s. Tahitian pearls from French Polynesian in the 1960s, and uh, Chinese freshwater pearls in the 1970s. But I like the story of how you culture a pearl, because it's a lot of fun words. Okay. Like gonads. Okay. (laughs) So, uh, culturing a pearl, they call it farming pearls. Right. Which it really is because you're working with live animals. Pearls are what you call an organic gemstone. They are made from living things. And what a farmer will do is take mantle tissue from a donor mollusk. Now, this is in salt water. This is strictly salt water. Take mantle tissue from a donor mollusk, surgically implant it, with a bead nucleus into the host mollusk's gonad. What is a gonad? It's the reproductive organ. So they slice and dice, put it in there. And then you grow a pearl. The the donor mantle tissue forms a pearl sac, which secretes the nacre and coats the bead to form a pearl. So they can use all different kinds of centers for that bead nucleus. Right. Um, plastic. Yep. A lot of times it's just plastic beads. I'll, and also, uh, they'll make a bead out of the shell of a mollusk. Hmm. So then they'll implant that too. Uh, with freshwater pearls, there are no gonads involved. Farmers just insert small, um, small mantle tissue pieces from a donor into the host mantle, and the host um, usually forms pearls around each implanted piece. And that's why freshwater is less expensive and typically you know, in less demand because yes. of the fact that you, you can, can grow, grow lots of pearls on a, in a single mollusk, mm-hmm. whereas with salt water, it's only really one pearl per mollusk and... Then that's the the other thing with when you're talking about overfishing. It's in order to get a pearl out of a mollusk, you have to kill the mollusk. Now that's well, not true now yeah. with cultured pearls. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you can get multiple pearls. You can implant multiple times, but usually only what are, were we told like two or three times. Well, it depends on the variety. Mm. So when we go through the varieties, I'll tell you how many times they can be nucleated. Okay. Yeah, that's what that nucleated. Word's called. And the people that do it are called nucleators Ooh. and it really is crazy they're sitting it's like it's like surgery i mean it's like surgery for the little the little oyster they go in they open it up just a little bit and they use tiny little surgical instruments and implant all these different things and you have to be very because the most oysters animals are, aren't that are small fragile. no some are quite big yeah i mean yeah. surgery man it's surgery on your gonads <laughs> on your gonads <laughs> But uh, it's pearl farms are pretty cool things. They really try to control all the factors that will affect the pearl to get the biggest yield out of that production. 
by feeding them certain things and mm-hmm. water temperature, water temperature, all that good stuff. Um, so types of cultured pearls. We started with the Japanese type, which is the akoya. Right. Do you know the species of oyster that is used? It's my favorite one. Pintata ficata? Yes. The pintata ficata. It's the best one to say. So that is the species of oysters that creates the akoya pearl from Japan. The pearl um, size will range from 2 to 10 millimeters. Average is 6 to 10 millimeters. So it's not a very large pearl, but they have excellent luster with a, like almost a mirror-like appearance. And the color is, the perfect color is white with a rosé overtone. And they're just, they're absolutely gorgeous. We all know how you love a rosé. I do. I do. The best thing about Akoya Pearls is they are consistent in size and shape. So they are crazy uniform. About 70% of your Akoya Pearls are spherical, which is crazy. And they are ideal for making strands. Yeah. Your classic pearl strand. Either graduated, which starts with a bigger pearl as your main pearl in the center, and then graduating to smaller pearls as you go around the neck, or same size strand. Uh, One, so we're talking about the number of nucleations. You can have only one with an Okoya pearl, and and then it dies. Care, can't use it anymore. Um, do they eat them? I don't. I don't know. Do you know how long it takes for it to grow? I don't. Six months to two years. Wow. Yeah, it takes some time. There's some dedication in this. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and we'll it, have to find out if they eat them. I mean, I would guess oysters are delicious. Yeah, and why waste it? Why you get waste the pearl it? Out, you might as well eat it. You might. I mean, it's gonna die anyway. Who knows if it tastes good though? Yeah, maybe they just feed it to other fish. Yeah. So in the 90s, many of these pink tata fucata oysters began to die. Uh, and Ooh, it, disease. Yeah, disease. It took them a while to identify it as an infectious disease. But even in 2003, production was only 30% of what it once was. So they have found a remedy for this disease and production is coming back slowly and steadily. But it really left a hole in the market, which I think um, the Chinese freshwater pearls feel, filled. But we'll get to those in a minute. We're talking salt water right now. Salty. So the next cultured pearl that I want to talk about is South Sea. Mm. I love South Sea pearls. And that's the Pintata Maxima. Yes, and I think Maxima like big. These are the biggest pearls. Right. These are the biggest pearls you're going to get. And there are two types. There's either the pink or wait, sorry, the gold lipped version or the silver lipped version. And that accounts for the pearl's color, of course. Right. But you can, they can be white, silver, pink, gold, cream, or any combination of these. Mm -hmm. But still beautiful. I love the gold. Yeah, golds are beautiful. And they, they're from Australia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. And they range from 8 millimeters to 18 millimeters, which is why we're talking big pearls here. Yeah, they're the largest and the rarest, and therefore the most valuable. Yeah, and they have almost like a soft satin luster, as opposed to the Akoya that has that mirror-like luster. They're like... Yeah. Super soft. They have a softer look. Um, Not as much of a, a mirrory, glassy look. These have a softer look. Yeah. Now, they take 18 months to three years to grow a pearl. Wow. You can nucleate them, which means harvest them, between one to four times. Hmm. Yeah, so they don't instantly. I mean, you don't. You don't. Sometimes build. you can reuse them. You can sometimes reuse them. Now think about how they must live for quite a while then, because if it takes that long, eighteen months to three years, and you can do it how many? Three to four times. Uh, one to four. One to four times. Yeah, and the age that you can first nucleate them, about two to three years. 
Wow. So you have to spend a lot of time growing these guys. And it's also in really deep water too, right? In comparison with like the Akoyas. Mm -hmm. So that makes it more complicated too because the divers have to be diving much deeper. Yeah. Crazy. Now, the percent of spherical South Sea pearls is about 25 to 40%. So those are perfectly spherical uh, now, uh, as opposed to the Akoya, which is 70%. But you can still do a lot with, I, they call them Baroque, Baroque style pearls. Um, which I like. I do too. I think they're beautiful. They're, they're beautiful. Uh, okay, next, just traveling around the sea is the Tahitian pearl. Mm. And do you know the species for that? I'm going to have you say this one. Uh, Actually, I practice it a couple times. <laughs> uh, it's Pinctata margaritifera? Pinctata margaritifera. Okay. Tifera. Tifera. Yes. Yeah. And, and otherwise known as black pearls. Black-lipped oyster. Right. The black-lipped oyster because it produces... Dark or black pearls, um, but it can also give you colors that are called peacock, yeah, and green, aubergine, pur- purple, and pistachio. Blue. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and they're and they all have a dark. Ba- they're all dark base. It's a dark base, but they're not really black. black. Yeah, they're more of a silvery gray than they are black. That has this beautiful like yeah. peacock luster to it. Um, they at, they range between 8 and 17 millimeters in size. They have to be three years old when you first nucleate them. Right. They can be nucleated two to three times, and it takes about 18 months to two years to grow a Tahitian pearl. Right, and they would be the second most valuable. Yeah, they come 30 to 40% spherical. Wow, not very much. Not very much. Um but they are amazing. Yeah. Beautiful. I have a strand of Tahitians, but they are not perfectly spherical. We call them circle pearls because they kind of have rings around them. And we'll get, I think we'll get a little more into this next week when we talk about the differences and quality factors and all of that kind of stuff. But your classic massive Tahitian strand commands an amazing price of course i mean they're just beautiful beautiful there's something about wearing pearls like the heft of them yeah and they're cool you put them on your neck and it could be the hottest day in the summer and they just feel cool Hmm. they keep you cool it's the craziest thing i think every girl should have a pearl necklace in her jewelry collection of course it's classic yeah timeless timeless Timeless. I think I should have one. <laughs> you should. They're cooling. I like to be cool. <laughs> you do. It sounds awesome. We could get you a little, you know, like our 20s had those amber necklaces for teething. Yeah, we could for get teething. Jonathan a little pearl necklace for cooling. <laughs> Back to reality. Akoya, South Sea, Tahitian are all saltwater type pearls. Um, you're, you have a freshwater cultured pearl, which the majority of them come from China. Right. Um, I'm going to say the name of this and I wrote it out phonetically okay. so that I could say the name of the species, species of freshwater mollusk. It's a Hiri opus cominji. Ooh, yes, look at you go. I did. And that, so that's the type of mollusk. Uh, the pearl size ranges from two millimeters to 13 millimeters. Big range. Now, when they were first introduced in the 1970s, they appeared on the market as rice pearls. Mm. So they looked like tiny little grains of rice. Mm. And over the decades, um, starting about the early 2000s, they came to the market with round or near round it just blew. pearls. And it blew up. But do you know what? Only 2% of freshwater pearls are spherical. Whoa, that's a lot of... Non spherical, <laughs> not a, waste because they're they still use them. Used. Yeah, they use them for other things. But when you so, look out on the market, you see how many freshwater pearls there are. Like you go to some trade shows, and it's just like booth after booth after booth, just 
in piles. Yeah, so piles it's, it's hard to estimate how many tons of pearls are produced in China because the government doesn't really release, release that, information. that information. But in 2004, they were estimating between 440 to 660 tons of pearls, of pearls produced that year. So even at 2%, you still have about 10 tons of, of round, pearls round pearls every year. Holy that are being smokes. produced in China. That is a lot of pearls. So what that has done is it's forced prices down. Of course. Yeah, because there's more pearls than anyone could possibly sell in a year, yeah. especially if they're producing that every year. Yeah, and they and they are they're actually I mean it depends. They can be first nucleated between one and two years old. Okay. Um they can be nucleated they can have up to 40 pearls per mollusk, and they can be nucleated one to two times. But it can take 24 months to 72 months to grow these things. So they do take a while. They do take a while, but you get high yield with 40 per nucleation. Yeah. I mean, super high yield. But it really has made, and we've seen... The popularity of pearl increased dramatically in the last 10 years. Sure. And like I was saying before, where the Akoya pearls got sick and they were all dying, the Akoya oysters. Fresh water just kept on going. Fresh water came in and filled the void that Akoya left. Hmm. But Akoya's coming back. And I don't think you can compare them no. dollar for dollar. Freshwater pearls... Don't have the luster that Akoya pearls have. No, definitely not. They're not nearly as beautiful as I would say saltwater pearls are. So we've been told to wrap it, wrap it up. It's a good first episode. It's a good first episode of. There's pearls. a lot more to cover. So much more. The pearls are fascinating. I I mean, and in and in ancient times, you didn't you don't have to do much to a pearl to make it beautiful. No, you pull it out. No, it's of pretty mollusk. simple. Yeah. Well, yeah, and then just from a jewelry standpoint, too. You, you drill a hole in it. You drill a hole in it and you put it on a string. Well, yeah. I mean, it's a little more complicated than that. We can get into that next week. But still, it's pearls are cool. Next week, I'll give you a little hint. I will tell you about the world's largest pearl. I know. I'm looking at a picture of this, and I'm like, what did it grow in? I don't even know what it could have formed in. It's insane. But we'll talk about that next about week. next week. Off to pick up the Twinnies at school. Off to Seattle. Off to Seattle. They're going to be flower girls this weekend. Lord and help us. We're going to make it down that aisle. Shout out to Katie and Jason, who are getting my cousin, who's getting married this weekend. And yep. then I'm off to Florida for a trade show. So we got a lot going on. And then Africa. And then Africa. But so, we'll be back next week. We'll be before back Africa. next week. <laughs> before Africa. We still have, I, yeah, give me I, a week. Calm down. Calm down, Jack, and it'll be okay. But anyway, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Gem Junkies. We sure do enjoy it. Uh, I'm Brecken. And Jonathan. And if you want to follow what we do in real life, you can always um, catch us at Parlay Gems on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And don't forget to join our Gem Junkies group on, on our Facebook. Facebook page. All right. Thanks, guys. See you later. Bye-bye.